There is nothing worth living for unless it is worth dying for. My grandmother lived a life devoted to Jesus, and today her talks have been made available in their original form. So you too can be built up through the insights and mysteries God revealed to her throughout her ministry. Now, without further ado, here is Elizabeth Elliot. My topic, you already know, is the simplified life, a simplified life. I've tried to emphasize God's providence, his mysterious and unpredictable and unaccountable workings. The song that we've just heard is a reminder of that. God does not discuss things with us. He does not define things for us. He doesn't tell us that he's going to give us a blueprint of everything that's going to happen. He simply gives us the infrangible promise. Everything that happens fits into a pattern for good. So we need not know how it fits. We need to remember that it fits. And we thought last night about Mary, how she surrendered gladly and unreservedly to the undefined, faithfully obedient and active in everything that was needed for the fulfillment of her duties, the ordinary duties of the moment, and submissive, humble, and self-forgetting in everything else. She disengaged herself from her feelings, which is something that most of us have to do very often when it comes to obedience to God. We obey not because we feel good about it, not because we're in the mood to obey, but because we want, honestly, to be followers of Jesus Christ. So how shall we think about this simplified life? Crucial passage, familiar verses probably to many of you. Matthew eleven twenty eight to 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Those of us who long for a simplified life probably do so because we do often feel tired and overburdened. And Jesus has given us the formula for peace. Three things, come to me, take my yoke, and learn. And I picture that yoke as being the double yoke for oxen. Two oxen are forced to work in harmony when they are under that yoke. And the yoke, which I believe Jesus must have been talking about here, is the doing of the Father's will. That was the yoke under which Jesus bent his neck. And so he says to you and me, if we are tired and overburdened, longing for rest. Come, I will give it to you, but you must take my yoke. That means we must bend our necks under the yoke that Jesus also bears along with us, the, the will of the Father. You remember Jesus said, I came not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And then we're to learn as we come and bend our necks we are to learn. And he tells us that we must learn his gentleness and his humility. Meekness in the King James Version. I am meek and lowly. Meekness never means weakness. The Old Testament tells us that the most meek man that ever lived was Moses. None of us would think of Moses as being a weak man. And surely we know that our Savior Jesus was not a weak man. He said, I am meek. But the word also means gentle, teachable, open, receptive. Are you gentle and teachable and open and receptive? Someone was reminding me last night of a little story that I've told about my dear Canadian mom. She was one of the many 
spiritual mothers who have blessed my life, and her name was Mrs. Cunningham. I called her Mom Cunningham. I met her when I was a Bible school student at Prairie Bible Institute in Alberta. And many years later, after each of us had been widowed, we were together talking about what, it, what it's like to be widowed. Our husbands had fairly recently died. And she said to me in her wonderful Scottish accent, Oh, Betty dear. She always called me Betty dear. You think of so many things that you shouldn't have done. And you think of so many things that you wish you had done for him. And I said, Lord, why didn't you show me? And he said, because you weren't ready to be shown. <laughs> I hope that there are many here this morning who are ready to be shown. But it does take coming to Jesus, accepting the yoke, and learning gentleness and humility. Someone has said, rest is not quitting the busy career. And that word career used in those days, 200 years ago, meant whatever our work happens to be, not in the very limited sense in which career is used today. Rest is not quitting the busy career. Rest is the fitting of self to its sphere. We've been talking about God's assigned portion, the sphere, the position, the place in which God puts us. Are you prepared to fit yourself into that place, which may be a lowly one, it may be a hidden one, it may seem to you like a very cramped one, but you will find rest as you come and take the yoke of Jesus upon you and fit yourself into the sphere as Jesus did. Think of how he fit him, fitted himself into a virgin's womb. Talk about a cramped space. Think of how he was born like any other human child, passing through that confined birth canal, he who made the worlds, and submitting to being a little child who cries and hurts himself and needs a mother. We are to fit ourselves to the sphere in which God has put us. Now, how can we obtain a simplified life? The first condition is accepting the will of God. Doing everything for God. These things go together. It's very difficult for me to separate things necessarily into points one, two, three, and four because they're almost simultaneous and interchangeable. Accepting the will of God and doing everything for God means accepting my place, accepting my work, accepting my children, accepting my husband, accepting my lack of a husband, or whatever. Acceptance, glad, wholehearted, yes, Lord kind of acceptance. And then the willingness to offer myself back to him with thanksgiving and doing everything, all that I am, all that I do, all that I suffer, all that I have, offering that back to him. Now, probably many of you have thought about offering to God all that you are and perhaps all that you have and perhaps all that you do, but perhaps you have not thought about offering to God your sufferings. It wasn't until my second husband was dying of cancer that I began very dimly and slowly to understand a little bit about what the New Testament clearly teaches, that suffering is a gift. Paul said, unto you it is given not only to believe, but also to suffer. And what am I to do with every gift that God gives me? Receive it with thanksgiving and offer it back. Offer up your children, offer up your marriage, offer up your hopes, your dreams, your sorrows, 
and offer up your sufferings. So that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about doing everything for God. Now, if Christianity is not practical, if it doesn't make a difference, a daily, hourly difference in your ordinary life, your most routine, humdrum life, it's not Christianity. Christianity is practical or it's nothing. And in my current newsletter, the September-October one, I have an article begin on, entitled, What Love Does, and I'll read you a little bit of it. At a conference where I was speaking about the little sacrifices of love, I suggested that if, for example, your husband drops his clothes on the floor and leaves them there, you might, instead of nagging, your views on the subject have been well known to him for a long time, simply pick them up. That sort of suggestion doesn't go over well these days. We're terrified of being walked on or becoming codependent or enablers. Am I ringing any bells out there? So one woman's questions following the talk were, why shouldn't my husband change and quit dropping his clothes? As if I had suggested that her husband shouldn't change. As if I had suggested that it's fine for a husband to drop his clothes. It's crazy. It's stupid. It's selfish, isn't it? But I wasn't talking to husbands. I was talking to wives. So her second question was, well, if he doesn't, then how do I handle the resentment that I feel? Now, my dear precious sisters in the Lord, how do we handle any emotion that we can't handle? What do you expect me to say to this? Well, these were my answers to her questions. Number one, about why shouldn't her husband change, it has become perfectly clear that I cannot change him. We cannot change our husbands. Most of us can think of one or two tiny ways in which we might like to. <laughs> but forget it. It's not going to work, so forget it. You might change him by a gentle and quiet spirit and by praying for him and keep your mouth shut. You know, Paul, Peter says in 1 Peter 3, he might be one, he may be one, without a word being spoken. And yesterday morning we heard the preacher talking about the woman trying to get her husband to paint the house. When she finally shut up, guess what he did? He painted the house. Now, now as for the second question, how, does, how do I handle the resentment I feel? Here the question pierces to the heart. My heart, my attitude toward the man, which reveals my attitude toward Jesus himself for what I do to one of his brothers, I do to him. Remember, Jesus said, inasmuch as you've done it for one of the least of these my brothers, you've done it for me, or you've done it to me. Our treatment of other people is our treatment of Christ. So, as I reminded my daughter Valerie in the book that I wrote as a wedding present to her, Let Me Be a Woman, you marry a sinner. There simply isn't anything else to marry. <laughs> so the husband sins against his wife. And let us wives never forget, he too married a sinner. If he sins in being thoughtless, by dropping his clothes, for example, and my reaction is sinful, two wrongs don't make a right. Most questions about relationships can be answered quite simply if we ask ourselves this question, what does love do? And I know of one woman who made this complaint about her husband dropping clothes all over the place, and someone asked her, well, how long do you think it would take you if you picked up all his clothes every day. 
And she thought about it a minute, and she said, well, I guess probably about 20 minutes. And so the question then came to her, is 20 minutes a day worth saving your marriage? What we have is part of the measured portion. Given to me by the King of Kings because I hold a royal position and he has assigned exactly that portion to me today. It's none of my business what God's going to give me tomorrow or take away tomorrow. It's none of my business anymore what God has given in the past or taken away in the past. The past is gone and belongs only to God. The future is not here yet and God is already there. You ever think about that? God's already there. So there's nothing to worry about. Said the robin to the sparrow, I should really like to know why these anxious human beings rush about and worry so. Said the sparrow to the robin, friend, I think that it must be that they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. Now, do you want to learn to love God by embracing and receiving gladly what he wants to give you? Do you really want to learn to love in that way? Listen to this. If we could see events, duties, and sufferings as the very means used in the hand of God to make us like Jesus, we would need very little advice about solving our problems. We'd be relieved of the heavy and dangerous burdens needlessly imposed on those who take pleasure in exercising control. Let me make a few simple suggestions as to how to receive gladly the measured portion that God wants to give. First of all, stop complaining. Just cut it out. And a good place to start would be the weather. <laughs> now, we think that that's perfectly innocuous to complain about the weather. Everybody complains about the weather. Nobody does anything about it. You know what? I lived with three different jungle Indian tribes. Not one of those Indian tribes had any vocabulary for complaining about the weather. I never heard an Indian say what lousy weather. And we had lousy weather about 80% of the time in the jungle. We had 144 inches of rain in the rainforest. We had two seasons, the rainy one and the rainier one. <laughs> and any time we went out, we got soaked. We got mud up to our knees. And the roofs leaked, and when it rained, and when I lived in a house with no walls, the rain came through horizontally lots of times. So everything in the house got wet. I never heard an Indian say, what lousy weather. I mean, they never said anything about it. Not a word. So just shut up when it comes to complaining. <laughs> now, if there is one subject in the world more unutterably boring than any other subject that I can think of, it's one's health. <laughs> Do you really want to hear a recital of every single detail of that operation that so-and-so had? I mean, I don't want to hear about all those unmentionable organs and exactly what they did with them. I don't want to hear about the effects of what went wrong with those organs. I don't want to hear about it. I mean, somebody who's sick and I have an obligation to be compassionate, and it's certainly if I am the person who's there to take care of them and I did have to do 24-hour day nursing care for my poor husband, of course I was willing to listen. And I would ask him, you know, how do you feel? What's, what is it now? What, what do I need to do? And all that. But in polite conversation, in social situations, can we possibly learn to keep our mouths shut and not top the other person's story with my own operation? <laughs> and I speak particularly to the women of my generation. 
because the older we get, the more things go wrong. You know, the old car begins to break down piece by piece, and this happens, and that happens, and the other thing happens. And God knows all about it. You can talk to him about it all you want because he made you and he knows exactly what went wrong. But for heaven's sakes, have mercy on your friends. <laughs> now your family. Somebody comes up and shows me a picture of their children, their sweet little children, and I love looking at pictures of people's sweet little children, but I'm always tempted to show them the pictures of my sweet little grandchildren. And perhaps that other person doesn't have eight grandchildren, as I have, and I'd like to show them the pictures. Well, you know, these are trivialities, but it's I'm talking about one-upmanship. Everybody's been all over the world, and everybody has seen everything now, and Lars and I have realized that there's no point in taking very many pictures anymore because there isn't anybody that wants to look at them. I mean, I'm serious. We travel a lot, and we travel to exotic places, but we've decided that there's not much point in taking more than one or two pictures on each trip because what are you going to do with them? Who wants to see them? Everybody's been to Hungary. Everybody's been to Singapore. Everybody's been to South America. And so it's just a matter of does it matter that much? What we have, we can stop complaining about. What about money? Stop complaining about money. Do something about it. Quit spending it the way you do. Don't go into debt. Ask somebody to give you some help if you don't know anything about how to take care of your money. Keep a budget. Don't buy prepared foods. Don't even go down the freezer aisle at all. Don't even venture down that aisle. <clears throat> and don't picture yourself somewhere else but where you are. Never picture yourself somewhere other than where you are because it leads to discontent. Don't compare your lot with another person's. How did she ever get a husband like that? Look what I'm stuck with. <laughs> or what did he ever see in her? You know, I thought he was pretty attractive. You know, why did he ever marry her? Compare, don't compare your lot with another's. Don't dwell on the past or the future. We've already talked about that. The past belongs only to God. He's already in the future. And wishing, as someone has said, cuts the very sinews of our consolations. Wishing cuts the sinews of our consolations. And the antidote to all of that is to learn to love God by embracing gladly what he sends. Lord, you have assigned me my portion and my cup, and you have made my lot secure. I'll take it, Lord. I will receive this wrong done to me. I will accept this suffering. I will regard widowhood as a gift. Old age as a gift. The loss of my best friend as a gift. Why? How can I look at it as a, as a gift? Because it is part of the assigned portion. And God wants to reveal himself to me in a way that otherwise I would not have eyes to see or ears to hear if I were not in that position. If I had never been through the deep waters, how could I know his abiding presence in deep waters? If I had never been through a hot fire, how could I know the validity of his promise? When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. If I have never been through the valley of the shadow of the death, how shall I know that I will fear no evil? How will I know thou art with me until I've been there and seen the fulfillment of his promise? It is a gift, ladies. Everything is a gift. Lars took me to Norway for Christmas one time. We went way up into the most beautiful snow-filled fir, fir forest, exactly what you want a Christmas card from Norway to look like. Furs just loaded down with deep snow. And way up there in the woods lives a distant relative of his in a very lovely little house. And next to the house was a very beautiful 100-year-old log cabin. And they invited us into that cabin for supper. And the cabin was lit with candles. And there was spread out on this big wooden table, the most beautiful artistic array of cheeses and hams and thin meats and beautiful, delicious Norwegian breads. 
and all this candlelight, and there was a fire in the little fireplace, and there were fir boughs decorating the place. The smell was just heavenly. And on the wall was a little framed plaque with several Norwegian words that I didn't understand. So I asked what it was, what it meant. And several people consulted about how to translate it because it was sort of old Norse. But they said it means all is grace. All is grace. And that's become a motto of my life. Everything's a gift. All is grace. The gift of suffering. The gift of my obligations. This is why I wrote this book, A Path Through Suffering, because God has been teaching me through the path of suffering the transfiguring gifts that he wants to give us. The same thing I've tried to articulate in my book on loneliness, a path through loneliness. Not a how to do it, not a panacea, not a neat, quick fix, but the deep spiritual lesson of transformation. Joy out of sorrow, the garment of praise from the spirit of heaviness, beauty for ashes, the oil of joy in place of mourning. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to women. Common to women. What else is new? But God is faithful, and there's nothing new about that. God is faithful, who will never allow you to be tested beyond your ability to bear. Never. When I hear people say, well, I've just had it up to here. I can't handle it anymore. That's a declaration of no faith. Because you wouldn't be there if it was beyond your ability to bear. We think we know what portion we can stand and what we can't stand, but only God knows. And when the worst thing that we can ever imagine happens to us, what we never imagined when we imagined that possibility was the grace that would be there. I know that's true. I thought, if Jim dies, I will die. I cannot stand it. I can't live. I've waited five and a half years for this man. But what I couldn't visualize was the grace that would be there. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilt. All is grace. Will you receive today, not grudgingly, not hesitantly, but with both hands, gladly and thankfully, the measured portion that God wants to give to you. Will you follow that radiant example of Mary and say, Behold the handmaiden of the Lord, anything you say, Lord. Will you receive from God the lack of things that you wish you had? Will you also receive the things that you never would have wished for that you do have? It's all measured according to his perfect wisdom and his infinite love. God bless you. I pray you've been encouraged and inspired by what you've heard today. And will keep joining us here and on social media for my granny's inspiration. Until then, remember, the eternal God is your refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms.